Welcome to the NIHR Dementia Researcher Midday Lecture webinar. I'm Adam Smith and I'm the Programme Director in the NIHR National Director for Dementia Research based at University College London. Um, today I'm delighted to be joined by Anna Volkmer, also from UCL. Hi Anna. Hi there. Uh, for those who visit our website, Dementia Researcher, often you'll have already come across Anna, I've no doubt at all. She's been fantastic in writing uh, lots of blogs for us. She's hosted podcasts and participated in our podcasts before. Um, uh, and she's been great at sharing her work and experiences as she studies. Um, for those that don't know, Anna is a speech and language therapist and for the last few years she's been combining her clinical skills with her research interests and studying for a PhD. And I believe you've just had your Viva. I have, I have, yes. In these days of remote Vivas, which is something I'm sure I can get you to blog about at some point in the future. Absolutely. Um, so uh, now she's, I believe she's back to clinical work and uh, Anna today is going to talk about telehealth to enable access to interventions for people with dementia. Um, something that I think many of us are getting to grips with at the moment as we deliver healthcare in a different way during these trying times. Um, the talk will be around 20 minutes and then we've allowed 20, 10 minutes for questions at the end. Um, at the bottom of your screens you'll see a Q&A button there which you can use to add your questions at any time throughout the uh, discussion through the, the presentation but you can also do that at the end as well when I will put those questions to Anna and she will answer them uh, to camera. Um, we're also recording today's lecture so don't worry if you can't watch all of it and stay with us um, you'll be able to watch that back on our website uh, dementiaresearcher.nihr.ac.uk forward slash webinars and that will be available from sometime later today or tomorrow. Um, so thank you very much, uh, Anna. And if you could share your screen now, that would be fantastic. So hello, everybody. My name is Anna. I'm a clinical academic and I work both as a speech and language therapist at the National Hospital for Neurology and Neurodisability, which is part of UCLH, and um, also as a researcher and a teaching fellow at the University of College London. And in my clinical role, I work um, at the National in the Cognitive Disorders Clinic, and I see outpatients with dementia, particularly language-led dementia, and um, I assess them and I provide therapy and, and general management. And in the current climate, we've actually um, been delivering um, speech and language therapy, not in person, but more and more remotely, and I would say mostly via teletherapy. Um, and and we felt that was really important to continue doing that because so many of the people we were working with were anecdotally reporting a deterioration in their communication and cognition um, and they were attributing it to the social isolation that they were experiencing and the enormous upheaval that we we're all experiencing. So um, I thought it would be useful today to talk about telehealth to enable um, access to interventions for people with dementia and I'm going to just talk a little bit about the mechanics of it and then some information on our experiences clinically and then review the literature a little bit. So let me see if I can, there we go, move the, there you go. So I just thought it was um, helpful to reflect on the fact that it's, and look backwards to the bubonic plague, um, where actually before the bubonic plague in the UK, we'd already been gradually moving from arable farming to sheep farming. And the bubonic plague um, actually accelerated that shift. And I don't think it's that dissimilar to now, um, where we were already exploring in our community and often using regularly um, the internet for shopping, education, entertainment, um, exercises, and increasingly for healthcare delivery. Um, so I'm not surprised in some ways that this, uh, that COVID-19, that this has um, accelerated this transition. So in terms of um, telehealth, um, we in speech and language therapy and across, I think a lot of other disciplines, um, Think of telehealth at the moment just as the visual 
So talking to people via video camera, but actually the American Speech and Language um, Hearing Association um, categorizes it into different elements. And the, the first element being M health or remote health, where you can deliver therapy via apps or via websites that store data. And then the therapist or the researcher can collect that data. Then what I think of as the telehealth, so the video conferencing um, element, that is what we call synchronous delivery of telehealth or telepractice, whereby um, the speech and language therapist can sit at the exact same time to the patient in another room um, doing a, a therapy session. And then the final version, which is asynchronous, which is in a way where um, information is tailored to the needs of the person, um, but it's not transmitted. So you might make videos and develop materials and email it or put it, host it on a website for that person, but it's not done live at the same moment. And what I'm going to talk to you about today mostly is the, what I would call telepractice. So the practice of video conferencing. And um, I wanted to share with you the, some of the things we've already experienced clinically here in the, and in the, at the National in terms of the acceptability of some of this work that we've been doing. And we see people here at the National from all over the UK. And so it, we'd already actually been explore, exploring telehealth as an option um, prior to the current COVID crisis. Um, and now we've been pushed in, in a way. I mentioned it's been a bit of a um, it's been a bit of a catalyst to be delivering our, this um, service from the majority of our clients. And in general, it's been really, really successful. And we estimate that we are seeing around 95% of our dementia patients in speech and language therapy using teletherapy. And the feedback we've been getting from people um, has been that it's really reducing the traveling burden. So given that we deliver services to people across the UK, some people are traveling miles and miles and miles to get to us. And by the time they get here, they're really rather fatigued. Um, so it's actually much easier for people. It's also cheaper because they don't have to pay for the traveling. Um, and some people have been really surprised. So some, you know, we, we've literally had um, people say, this is actually so easy. I wish I'd tried this before. Um, it's almost like being with you in the flesh, but I don't have, someone said to me, it's like you're in my house, but I don't have to tidy up or put my makeup on. Um, so people feel that it's really, really useful for them. They're generally feeding back that they feel really supported. So they, um, despite experiencing dips in uh, cognition and, and language and people finding their loss of schedule, loss of activities really disruptive, having some support is, has been really valuable to people. And, and anecdotally as well, we've found that um, across the UK, there's not speech therapy delivered um, in all different areas. So we call it a bit of a postcode lottery. So some regional areas of the UK or some regions aren't able to provide speech and language therapy for people with dementia or language led dementia for often because they don't have the resources and or the or they have very restrictive service criteria and equally maybe because they're the local health professionals who are diagnosing dementia don't know about the role of speech therapists um, but actually being able to provide therapy through this kind of telehealth method is people said they feel that they're getting more equitable service, equitable access. And as a clinician, I have found that I'm able to um, have a really good insight to someone's functional communication. So when they're coming into the sterile um, hospital environment, I have a very different perspective of their language and their conversational skills then when I'm able to see them in their own home and people are able to take their video cameras and show me their garden and their, their, their pictures on the wall. It's really interesting functional insight. And of course, it reduces the infection risk. That said, it's really dependent on the um, internet connection and security can be an issue. And of course, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about technology in a minute, but some people don't, haven't always had the knowledge of which technology um, or the, the means of, of using that technology. Some of the people we've worked with who've had hearing impairments have struggled a little bit with audio components. And of course, sometimes building rapport is very tricky um, remotely, e even more tricky than in person. Um, and we, we're not always able to do a full assessment. 
So we are able to do um, some assessments remotely, but for example, the physical components can be a bit trickier. So um, interestingly and usefully, um, many of the, uh, the professional organizations have been putting together guidance documents and the Royal College of Speech and Language Therapy have, de develop, have developed a telehealth policy where they already had one, but they've been refining it to meet the needs of the current crisis. And within our organization, we are rapidly putting together and refining our telehealth policy. Um, and, and also rules of engagement. I think that's really valuable and important. But I thought I would just share some of those um, with you here, um, which I think are really helpful. So for example, the, the Royal College um, uh, comparison of the telehealth platforms is really helpful when you're planning what you might deliver and um, they also highlight things like how many people not only the security components and which ones are for example approved by NHS digital which are the Accurix and the attend anywhere but also the capacity for these types of forums to host more than one person so for example I recently was able to do a, a consult with a woman in a nursing home who had um, a semantic variant um, uh, dementia semantic variant PPA and her both her daughters were able to attend that meeting just remotely as well which was really helpful so Moving on to the research literature. So I've spoken about what's um, been happening in clinical practice and what some of the people we're, we're treating think, but I just wanted to highlight what the, clinical, what the research evidence is saying. And actually there's, there's a fairly burgeoning literature in this area for people with dementia. So I just wanted to give a couple of examples up here. Noticeably, much of this research literature is focusing on um, disciplines where therapy also includes the caregiver. So for example, directly targeting the caregiver or dyadic. So both a therapy that's delivered to both the person and the partner together. And, um, and in fact, that probably mirrors a lot of the intervention that we're delivering clinically here, which is often facilitated by the carer. Um, and we recognize, however, that often these video um, conferencing methods are actually much more because the other option is is often a telephone appointment and actually the video consults are much more inclusive than just a video um, than just a telephone appointment because you can actually include even the most impaired person through a video consult can get the gist and the the, the communication and the non-verbal communication and is able to participate that said there is more of a focus now on diversity of interventions for dementia um, especially on rehab and therapy, which is useful. And I just wanted to summarize a few key points from a recent um, review, um, a systematic review um, that was published about video telehealth for dementia management. Um, and they, they actually highlighted some, this, this slide highlights some key points from 11 studies that they looked at in their review. And the majority of which, again, were protocolized interventions, primarily for the caregiver. And interestingly, a lot of these were delivered in groups um, via video conferencing. And it wasn't always necessarily clear which key health professional in this research was delivering the interventions. And often, um, apparently, they needed a lot of tech support, um, not necessarily something we, we haven't experienced a massive volume of tech support. Um, needing to be given. Um, but actually in these studies, they, they're not always describing the technology that they're using fully. And um, what, what I think was really valuable, however, to say is that there's, they feel, so this, the, this review summarized that um, telehealth appears to be as effective as face-to-face -face in, in terms of delivering interventions for the caregivers um, of people with dementia. But there just isn't enough in, uh, enough um, information on whether there are equitable outcomes for people themselves who are living with dementia. Essentially highlighting that we need a lot more research in this area. Now, um, moving to specifically to the speech and language therapy literature, there's also been a very recent, um, even more, uh, very recent systematic review of telepractice for adult speech and language therapy services. And um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the three articles that focused on language-led dementia or dementia at all. But before I do this, I wanted to put this into context of um, 
the, the broader literature on language-led dementia. So the broader literature on language-led dementia interventions um, really predominantly focuses on impairment-focused interventions, so word relearning therapies, whereas more functional interventions um, haven't really been explored very much. And the functional interventions that have been explored have often been actually delivered with a, with a communication partner or a caregiver and have focused on building a person's strategies, building their existing um, strengths. And in general, these more functional inter interventions themselves have lacked a robust design and they've lacked rigor often because they haven't had the participant numbers to demonstrate rigor. So I've only got a couple more slides because I'm mindful of time. So. Um, these are the three um, articles that I wanted to draw out from that systematic review that focus on teletherapy for primary progressive aphasia, so for language-led dementia. And the key thing to say is that these three um, articles basically always focus um, on impairment-based therapies. So a huge component of these are about word relearning. So the Maya study on the left this demonstrated the feasibility of using teletherapy or te video conferencing to deliver what we call phonological and orthographic treatments of naming repairments. So therapy for naming, those kind of exercises. The, the um, intervention in the middle, um, published by Dahl et al., they found that um, using iPads and video conferencing to deliver what we call um, word retrieval therapies or script training was, uh, was really effective. And actually it was so, they found their results were comparable to delivering these interventions face to face, such that this group of researchers are now including both um, therapy delivered face to face and remotely in the same larger trials. And then finally, the third example by Rogalski et al. Um, over in, in um, the US, they've developed a fan, an online uh, web portal which combines all these features. So they do a bit of video conferencing therapy and um, they do a bit of, um, uh, they, they have, each person has access to their own part on the website and they make videos specifically for that person's therapy. They, they link them to apps and word practicing um, activities. And this, this study has actually also explored things like um, more functional therapies, like uh, slightly uh, giving people more advice on communication partner training, um, looking at um, communication aids. Um, but, and this study is, uh, they've shown it through their pilot feasibility study that it's acceptable and it's feasible, but they haven't yet got any effectiveness data for us to work with. Um, and the reason I think it's important for me to um, flag, so this is some of my research. Um, so I've asked speech and language therapists across the UK who work with people with language-led dementia. I asked them what they do in therapy, face-to-face -face therapy. And what they do in face-to-face -face therapy, and I've listed all different types of therapy along the bottom, um, and then I've listed the number of therapists who've responded to this, um, so this survey. So this was the survey we did across the UK up the side. And I'm just going to highlight here that the more impairment based interventions were things they did. So the pink represents what people did um, not so often. So never really. Whereas green represents what they did often and always. Um, and actually what we see here is that the impairment based therapies aren't being delivered that much. Yet the teletherapy has mainly looked at, the research into teletherapy has mainly looked at these delivering these more impairment-based therapies. Yet speech and language therapists are more likely to do this kind of communication partner training. So the only article that's even vaguely discussed communication partner training is really very exploratory at the minute. And um, what we're doing, we've been currently doing a pilot study of a communication partner training therapy that we, I've developed as part of my PhD called Better Conversations for Primary Progressive Aphasia. And we've been delivering that intervention across 11 NHS sites by trained speech and language therapists who are, are, who are collaborators on the study. But one of the really key points with that 
is we've had to exclude. So these are, this is some of the recruitment data we've gathered so far on that study. And we've actually had to exclude a large proportion of people, many of whom have had to be excluded because of access issues. So not only um, were they geographically not close enough to the study, but also that their communication partners, so their family members who might have participated in therapy weren't always available um, from the hours of nine to five, Monday to Friday. Um, and that it was a real burden on some of the local collaborating therapists to participate in this kind of research. So my um, preliminary thoughts at this stage are whether if, um, if it is feasible for us, oh, sorry, to deliver the, you know, if it is feasible and acceptable to deliver complex interventions with um, people with, for people with dementia remotely, is, is it actually feasible and acceptable? There's been um, only a, a couple of studies that looked at feasibility. I didn't really find much on acceptability in the research literature, but actually looking at the um, for speech and language therapy being delivered to, um, remotely. But what we found is a very positive response. Um, my other question is, are the outcomes from remotely delivered interventions equitable to face-to-face -face delivery? So we, we, we can see that the research literature is starting to demonstrate that some of the more impairment-based therapies that speech therapy deliver is re resulting in equitable um, outcomes. Um, but we don't know that about the more complex interventions, the more functional interventions. But if so, if we can demonstrate this, is this an opportunity for us to recruit larger data sets for this type of research? Speech and language therapy and many of the therapies are particularly riddled with that problem of rigor, that it can be quite difficult to recruit enough people to a study to demonstrate rigor. So this type of intervention might be an opportunity. And finally, with um, back uh, with my clinical hat on, I couldn't leave this presentation without a few tips and hints for anybody who is delivering um, remote therapy or teletherapy themselves. This is some tips and hints that I've collected, that my colleagues have collected um, from over the, over the recent weeks and more and much longer than that. So just some ideas to think about when, if you are working with someone remotely, is preparing them not only with the technology, but also the therapy materials, making sure that you do structure these types of appointments um, and providing, but also providing an opportunity to chat. Um, so it's, it is amazing how comfortable people are with video calls. It's a real opportunity to suss out their communication skills and make sure you give people feedback on, on actually how you can see them. Um, you know, I think some people don't realize that they maybe cut off part, part, part of their face. So actually, or they might only, you might only be able to see their chest or their chin. So actually telling people as online how to participate in a video really helps. And, and also that counts for yourself as well, making sure that you're looking in the camera. Someone recently gave me a tip that on most video conferencing apps, you can move the picture of yourself up to the, up right under the camera, and thus you can look, or, or the person you're speaking to, right under the camera, and then you can look directly into your camera. So it feels like you're establishing a much more effective piece of eye contact. So these are my contact details here. So this is the last slide, and just a quick acknowledgement of all the people um, that I've ever worked with, and um, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anna. That was fantastic. Very concise. I, I loved it. That was really interesting. And I'm glad you covered the main points at the end there, because I was, I was going to ask what were your tips for other people that might be doing uh, about to do this? Because, of course, NHS Anywhere is, is being massively rolled out at the moment um, to continue to provide outpatient appointments and clinics. And so I, I know lots of people on here might be facing the same issues. Um, so uh, we'll go to questions now. Um, if anybody has any questions, if you'd like to um, open up the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen, tap your question in there and I will put your questions to um, Anna. <coughs> this is often where it, it takes longer, although no questions yeah. yet. <laughs> can, I, can, can I ask a question? Is there a particular, is it a particular application you're using to deliver this at UCL? It's a really good uh, question. <laughs> I knew someone would ask me that. So I, actually what we've found is that the, um, 
people will often problem solve it for us. So they will suggest that they've been using certain applications already with their grandchildren and their, and their, their own children and that they preference using um, applications that we might not always consider um, the most uh, appropriate but they preference them and they're able to say i understand the risks i understand um that you know i but i would preference this so facetime has been a very popular one and um, and and that's because people are using it really really regularly and then the other one i have used a bit is skype um and and even zoom zoom's great because you um people you you don't have to um uh, you know, they don't have to have an application loaded on their phone. They can just click on the link um, as we're doing right now. But um, one of the things that we always recommend if you're using a Zoom call is to make sure it's a locked meeting um, with, a, with a password protected meeting and making sure that people understand that it isn't entire, you know, that, that there are risks associated with any type of video conferencing um, application, I think is also important. But I would say, almost every time the people themselves have already they're so aware of that and they're much they're so happy to continue anyway that's fascinating because i was interested whether you kind of force them to use a particular type of but it, it's really interesting to hear that you kind of you might suggest one but you're open to using whatever they're already familiar with i think routinely i would um if it, if it wasn't for the current climate we probably might be much more apprehensive and would um, really, really aim to use uh, things like attend anywhere, which we haven't actually, we, we're kind of gradually starting to use. But given that some, a lot of our patients are saying to us, well, you, they'd say to us, if it wasn't coronavirus, I'd get my son or my granddaughter in to help me set all this up, but I can't get anybody in to help me. So it's this or nothing. So, so you find yourself flicking between kind of Google Hangouts and Zoom and Skype and- Absolutely. Got I mean, as we all are doing right now between different people setting up different meetings and using things. We've got our first question, uh, which is from Lillian Hun, uh, who asks, can you speak a bit about the technology barriers and how you overcome them? Example, training for carers and people with dementia, Wi-Fi, access to a computer. I guess that's a good point. I mean, if they if somebody at home doesn't have Wi-Fi or a computer, essentially, then they're excluded, are they? I, I, I've been doing, yes they are um but i've been doing um these type of consults for the since the beginning of march for almost every one of my patients and it's the very small percentage who don't have it at the moment um uh, and those people i'm able to use telephone with um but yeah it, it is a barrier but i think it's a barrier that will be something we have to explore more as time goes on but so there's some work been done at um, City University by the Speech and Language Research Department and with people with straight related communication difficulties. And one of the things they've particularly looked at is access, ac accessibility and acceptability and the need for training. And they've, that one of the things that's come up is that if you can make the very first meeting successful, so almost having like an experiment meeting that's not a therapy session necessarily, or not a research session, if that's successful, um, then people are often, well, their people are much more likely to be happy to continue anything. So it's, it's often just about that very first session. And I would also say that um, in terms of training, um, the main types of I, training I would suggest, it, it not necessarily training, but more tweaking. So it's things like talking to people about how to, um, and it can be done online. So making sure that they're actually in the picture, making sure that they are, um, you know, that they, so that you can see them and they can see you. Um, and, and generally a, a lot of people have been um, able to manage that. That's good, fantastic, thank you. Um, <clears throat> we've got another question now from, um, Liz Court, who asks, uh, do you have any experience of balancing communication if the caregiver is more co talkative? That's yes, of course, that happens a lot in speech and language therapy appointments where one person is um, uh, where the person, a person has a communication difficulty and it often happens in face to face conversations as well. 
Um, and as with any, I would use the same strategies that I would use in a face-to-face -face meeting. And um, so I might explain to them the role of the speech and language therapist. I would outline, I always aim to outline the structure of the therapy session at the, or the assessment session at the beginning of the call so that you set the boundaries, for example, saying, you know, we will spend a certain amount of time getting a history or having a conversation. Then I will be spending a certain amount of time doing this assessment or therapy task um, and that will involve only me and the person with the communication difficulty and then there'll be an opportunity to, to discuss the results so really setting the and outlining the boundaries and giving them kind of directing them to the time when it might be appropriate for them for them to chat and discuss and then if they do kind of get involved or interrupt I think it can be quite useful to actually say it's a really good question I'll talk to you about that later a really good question i'll talk to you about that in that end 10 minutes so you're you're establishing a um, a practice for future sessions and that's why well, I, I thought your point was interesting which i hadn't considered before because i mean realizing that communications is more than just what you say having talked to you guys on podcasts before having cameras positioned in such a way whereas it's taking in maybe all the upper body or or, yeah. or things like that rather than just somebody's close-up face i guess and, and being able to see the carer and the the person you're treating as well at the same time potentially yeah, yeah absolutely even when so i found that even when you're doing a consultation and the um you start on the phone and the, the carer says oh you don't you know that my relative my husband my partner cannot communicate i'm not sure there's much point in us doing a video call <coughs> what i found is even doing a video call because the person can actually then potentially see you they might they often feel more included they might be able to engage with you more visually it's quite you know it's quite surprising i've had um the most wonderful conversations with couples um who at home who i had seen in clinic where they'd come into clinic and they it was very you know the clinical environment's quite sterile they're very appropriate the person with communication difficulties wouldn't say much their partner would talk then i'd see them at home via video conferencing and suddenly the partner would say to me, the one with the communication difficulties might say, oh, would you like to see my garden? And oh, there's the picture on the wall. And, or, and so they can actually, there's more resources available at home to communicate. And equally, they feel more comfortable. So I've been able to observe some really interesting and really effective. So it's re been really a good way of revealing competence. So this particular couple, I'm always thinking of the, the wife who had the diagnosis of language led dementia. When I saw them at home, she was teasing her husband. She was making facial expressions at me. But it, and, and they actually explained when I asked them directly that this was their routine communication style and they'd always had it. And it was very competent and it really expressed their relationship. And I hadn't seen any of that in the clinical setting. Oh, fantastic. So I think even when all this is over, there's a good case to be made for potentially delivering this kind of session obviously in an ideal world this would be something you'd go to somebody's house to deliver but that that's obviously not possible these days but this sounds like a very a very good way forward thank you very much for that question uh, liz we've got one now from uh, caroline hall who asks if you're using facetime anna are you using your personal number we're trying to find a way through students interacting with clients and thinking through the risk issues yeah, does, do all your clients now have your home phone number? <laughs> I'm in a privileged position to have a work mobile phone. And I'm also in a, I guess the only other thing we've been able to get, do to get around that is some members, are, so we can also, you can also FaceTime via an iPad. So the, a lot of therapy and depart, and ther speech therapy departments clinically and a lot of speech therapy departments in research and a lot of, research departments often have an iPad or can access an iPad. You don't actually need um, somebody's home mobile phone, phone number. Often you can do it via emails. And that's what we're often, we, we're trying to do, use it, do FaceTime via email, which it reduces that risk as well. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, we've got another question now from Jennifer Whitfield, who asks, I was interested to hear that this works for gaining well, I was interested to hear that this works for gaining insight into functional communications, as this is a huge part of what we do for their client group. Uh, have you got any thoughts on how you might carry out life story work in this way? 
that's a really lovely idea. I think you, so I haven't necessarily done that. I mean, I've started exploring it and actually I had a, there was a couple I was working with who um, we were working at, doing a therapy session in via video conferencing in their home and I was trying to explain to them what a, a communication book or a life story book would be one of the things they um they had a very a huge number of bookcases behind them and I said to them oh do you have a photo album and what was really useful through the video um, conferencing call was their photo albums were literally right behind them. So we got out their photo albums. And um, one of the things that I was able, we were able to do was I was, they were able to share their photo albums with me. And I was then able to give them a better insight to what a life story, you know, what a communication history book might look like and how it might be different from the photo album, but also how it might be as effective. So then we started using the photo albums on the video call and the lady with dementia was showing me the photos. And so that kind of, um, I, I guess, thinking more laterally, that was really effective. And I think what you could, what you could do, even, you know, you could really use the video conferencing as a tool to ask people to take you around their home and around their lives. And, you know, you can take that. I've had patients take me into their gardens, show me what they're most proud of. So I think it's a really, it can be a really useful tool to explore that. And potentially to involve, I guess, other members of the family and neighbors yeah. and things like that, who they have a lot of communication with so that you're not entirely dependent upon the, the single, the single significant other or caregiver as well. Absolutely. Fantastic. Thank you for that question, Jennifer. Uh, we've got one more. Uh, uh, Lillian Hung again has asked, given the COVID situation in long term care, do you think that telehealth offers benefits in in care settings? And are there any resistance from nursing staff? I guess uh, thinking as well about your particular group, how have you found some of your colleagues? Your, I, I'm, I, I think you're quite forward thinking in many things, obviously, the, you know, through your PhD and through your research. I, I wouldn't want to assume that everybody in your profession feels the same. Um, how does that go down? Do you think that this can offer benefits in other ways and have there been resistance? Um, so I think some of this, we, it is tricky. So I think that in care homes, for example, um, we can't assume that care homes have access to anywhere near the amount of technology that, you might have access to in a hospital and even on the wards um, there isn't the amount of technology available we have had some resistance and um, and mainly because of the workload and um, that people if people are um finding it very if there's lots on so in the time in so on some of the covid wards we haven't had the adequate staff members. So we're trying to, for example, re reduce footfall on the wards. And so one of the suggestions has been that rather than speech therapists going on and doing swallow assessments and communication assessments, that there, there might be an iPad or a, um, an iPad given to or loaned to um, patients. Um, and actually, I think one of the things that's facilitated it is things like that us um, as a department trying to offer our own technology so rather than asking the wards to find their their you know find an ipad on the ward is us saying here we've got an ipad you can borrow for mr smith and then they don't so that helps and and then actually if we we can then also stress that you don't have to stand with that person while they're holding it so um that's also been really useful and i actually there's a few other things that i've encountered so i've and um, was I tuned into the National Mental Capacity Forum um, and there was a lot of discussion. They hosted a couple of webinars recently. And one of the key points they made was that, um, you know, we can do capacity assessments via the medium of, you know, virtual, virtually as well. So, well, virtually is the wrong word, sorry, via the medium of um, telecare. And so maybe we should also be thinking of this as a way of supporting and enabling the staff so they, so they feel they've got the tools, so we're part of their toolkit. Um, and in general, um, those kind of, that kind of approach, and also the support, the top-down support, actually, where I've mentioned to people that I attended a webinar hosted by the National Mental Capacity 
they said that we, you know, they've advocated this approach. That's been met with really a lot of, you know, wow, that's, they're supporting this. That must mean it's really, you know, is worth doing. That's been very helpful. But of course, it's a gradual approach and there will always be problems. And I wouldn't like to suggest there won't be. Um, but I think looking to the future, this is a great opportunity. I think it's, it's a great well, I mean, needs must and everything like that. And I think the NHS is fantastic at delivering innovation, yeah. particularly when it's forced upon it. Um, and, and having this opportunity right now to kind of test this in anger has been uh, fantastic to see whether this becomes a, a more familiar, normal way of working beyond the current challenges we face. And, and not just, of course, to delivering these things at home, but also delivering it to people who are at the another site or in still yeah. in inpatients whereas you know do you really have to go see that person in that bed particularly if as you say there's an infection risk or, or you know yeah. we've got c diff somewhere or something you, you can reduce those risks as well thank you very much anna thank you everybody for asking those questions as well we're really grateful for you agreeing to share with us today um, if anybody has any questions um, you will find anna on twitter uh, her Twitter name is at Volkma underscore Anna um, and uh, bio and information about her is also on the Dementia Researcher website um, where you'll also find uh, the recording from today's webinar will be there as well later today. Um, our next webinar will be at 3 p.m. on Wednesday the 6th of May with Dr Lillian Lillian Hung, who's been asking questions today, uh, discussing her work on music and dementia uh, using silent disco tech to deliver music and meditation therapy in hospitals. Um, the recording from today, as I said, will be on our website, along with the schedule of all other recordings, uh, future webinars, and how you can join those. Finally, if you'd like to join us and share your own work through one of our midday lecture webinars, please get in touch with us. Um, you can do that on Twitter with at dem underscore researcher, or you can drop us an email on dementia researcher at nihr.ac.uk. Thank you very much, Anna, again, for joining us. Thank you, everybody, for your questions. Um, Lillian just said thank you again. Very inspiring work. So thank you, everybody. And we'll see you again next week. And thanks, Anna. Thank you, Adam. Thanks. Bye-bye.